For those of you that have never attended one of our events before, um, Rural Roots to Climate Solutions is an Alberta-based nonprofit, um, and we operate out of the Settler Learning Center. So we host um, workshops, field days, and webinars across all of Alberta, um, empowering people with climate solutions. So we work primarily with agricultural producers and also rural Albertans um, to just create a space for discussions to happen around climate solutions. We're always really strong advocates of the idea that your climate solutions can also be some of your farm solutions. Um, so with all that out of the way, welcome to our webinar on cover crop custom blends with Kevin Elmy of Cover Crops Canada. Um, Kevin, I will hand things over to you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the invite to do the webinar today. So, uh, yeah, so the, some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today, um, to put things in perspective, I have my degree from the University of Saskatchewan in uh, from the College of Ag uh, many years ago, and the stuff that I was uh, taught at that time uh, and to my views and beliefs now are um, fairly different. Uh, I was trained as a traditional or conventional agronomist and um, had, you know, everything based on, on chemistry. And so chemistry, it plays a part of it, but the biochemistry is way more important in, in my mind. And this is what I've, I've learned. So uh, we, we farmed, I moved back to the farm in 1999 and uh, actually just about to the day we sold our farm a year ago. And so in that time, uh, the land that I purchased, it was burned and bailed for 50 years. So it was uh, completely hard. Uh, across the road was a gravel pit and I got the sand pile. So dealing with, with hard sand. So it just kind of a, an oxymoron of, of, of sand. But by doing some of the management practices differently, it was amazing how our soils changed. And so before the the the, the start of Regen Ag, you know, I had no one to really rely on for, for information. So it was uh, an interesting uh, growth curve. And and so, you know, looking at some of the people registered uh, on the list, uh, I see some familiar names in there. So, you know, you've heard me talk and, and I don't think I'm very too far in, in, uh, in my philosophy and, and, and core values. So, um, so right now I'm living in Olds. Um, I'm doing some consulting work for, for Imperial Seeds and doing some independent work with, uh, through the, the company we have, uh, Cover Crops Canada. So uh, I spend most of my winter going around doing presentations and uh, helping, helping and coaching farmers how to kick the kick the the input habit and get into regenerative ag agriculture management. So, without any further ado, and once again, because this is, I'm going to be talking about some some different philosophies of of how you know management wise. If you have issues uh, or questions, of, you know I'm confusing. Let me know, and we'll we'll address the the the, the steps when we when we're going into this. So today, basically, we'll talk about designing cover crop blends. Uh, at the end is I'll have a, a contact page, so if you're trying to get a hold of me, we can have further discussions on it after that. So when we start talking about cover crop blends, you know the scary part, the scariest part of getting into the cover cropping is deciding to do it. Because you know all of the fears of you know I I I can't afford a wreck. So when we decide to get into it, now the most intimidating part of it is deciding what we're going to be using in this mix that we're going to be using. So you know what species they're going to use, how many species do we use, when are we going to seed it, how are we going to manage it, what are what are our desired desired outcomes. So the first step that we need to do is set goals. And as a farmer, I hate setting goals because if we're looking at production goals, you know, mother nature is going to have one of the largest influences on what our yields are gonna be. But in this case, when we are looking at setting goals for setting cover crops and regen ag, what we're going to be doing is where do we wanna be six months from now, year from now, five years from now, and once again, depending on what, what your goals are and, 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 you know, different things like that, it could be, you know, in, in this case, you know, we need feed. So, okay, we're going to be uh, producing some feed. Are we going to hay it? Are we going to silage it? Are we going to graze it? If we're grazing it, are we continuous grazing, rotation grazing, or stockpile grazing? 
if we're going to be looking at soil improvement for goals, so are we looking at water infiltration, uh, erosion control, weed suppression, are we looking at improving our nutrient cycling or building organic matter? When we start looking at this, now what we need to take into account is what are we dealing with? What's our natural resource inventory? So what kind of soil texture or textures are we dealing with on that field or, or your farm? Is there any uh, salinity concerns? Topography, uh, like are we dealing with flat land, low land, uh, steeply sloped, erodible? Uh, what, what kind of topography do we have and, and how many different types do we have? What kind of vegetation is growing on there right now? And then the natural and man-made features. So do we have a, uh, a, a rocky uh, a ridge that we have to worry about or trying to manage? Or do we have a, a railway, rail line going across through, through one of the quarters? Because that's going to influence some of the, the soil hydrology, how the water moves. Uh, it's going to influence, uh, you know, they're, they're in order to, to build that railway uh, crossing going through the through the land, there's going to be some excavation work. So, you know, there's going to be some, some changes in, in how that, that soil looks like around that. And then the other one that's really important is what plants or what weeds are growing. There's a book that I highly recommend for people to buy, and it is, you can get it through Acres USA, and it is When Weeds Talk by J.L. McCammon. That book is, it's a nice it's about 25 bucks us so relatively cheap and what i like about it is number one it tells you you know the weeds what is the role of weeds weeds in in our ecosystems but when we start looking at individual species it gives you the conditions that gives that those plants those weeds the ecological advantage why they're growing so when we look at something like red root pigweed, if you tell me you have red root pigweed growing, that tells me that in your system, you have high nitrates in your system. And so there's some really easy ways of, of tying up that nitrate and make sure we don't create this excess nitrate so that we then create a, a, a weed issue. So looking and observing what weeds are growing is really crucial in finding out what the soil is telling us and what we need to do for change. When we start looking at the logistics, so when are we seeding? How are you seeding? So are we going to be doing some broadcasting or are we looking at drilling it in? Um, when you're seeding, so are we looking at, you know, early spring, late spring, into the summer, into the fall, or dormant seeding in the fall? Uh, what is the season for? forecast uh, another really important thing and one of the things I've been been investing in is this uh, guy called Drew Lerner he runs uh, world weather out of uh, Kansas City and what he does is he specializes in agricultural weather forecasts and so the, the really interesting thing is this this past fall he was talking about this high pressure ridge that was going to develop over western Canada and it was going to be centered over Alberta somewhere. And he didn't know how high, how north it was going to go, how, how far south. And the, the neat thing with it is he, he nailed it. And so when you're going through and, and, and with the weather systems, um, most of the weather we get are either from the Alaska lows or they come from Vancouver or they come from California. So these Colorado clippers. And with that high pressure system going over Alberta, most of the systems he said from Alaska are going to go up over north of into in through the piece over northern Saskatchewan, and then come back on the backside over eastern Saskatchewan, and that's where all the snow was going to be dumped. And if you know anybody in eastern Saskatchewan, there was a lot of snow there. Uh, and then this this clipper that's coming in from California now hitting hitting southern Manitoba, um, once again it it dipped below this this high pressure trough, and uh, is you know currently hitting hitting Winnipeg, and he was talking about all this stuff in October, so it's it's really I find he's a really good resource for for helping you know, identify what the the trends in the weather are going to be. 
So the other thing we want to know about the cover crop is how are we planning on terminating this, this blend? So are we looking at doing cultivation? Are we looking at herbicide? Are we grazing it? Do we want the frost to take it out at the first frost? Do we want that to be green right up until the snow flies? Or do we want it to overwinter? So those are the, you know, some of the options we have. Uh, this is our high-tech zero-till drill that we were using on the farm. So it's a 1986 Borgo 8800 air seeder. Um, you know, most of the time I was using one and three quarter inch hole openers and it was getting the job done. So do you need to go to get a disc drill? It gives you more options, but if you have something like this, you just need to know the, what your limitations of that equipment is. So if I went in and used a sweep or a, a spoon that was pointing forward on the C shank, uh, on this drill, what would happen is all of that residue would start wrapping around it because it's a hole opener that was going straight up and down all that residue would flow through and because we have a green plant that i was seeding into that it was anchored into the ground so it wasn't getting pulled out whereas if it was a, a, a canola stubble that got sprayed out or a cereal seeding into that if the plants were dead i'd be pulling the roots out and then once again it'd be creating piles and creating problems. So it's knowing what kind of uh, the limitations of that, that piece of equipment is. So when we are going through and we're doing this planning, you know, when we're developing this system, we need to do a bunch of pre-planning. And so, you know, thinking this time of year, planning that cover crop, when I'm gonna do it. And once again, it, it, like every other good plan, plans change. But what Steve Groff has said and always said is we need to treat cover crops like your cash crop. And that's, you know, so true because if you were going to go out and, you know, start making decisions in the middle of May, what you're planning on growing for cash crops this coming year, that would be really stressful. And most likely there'd be a lot of <laughs> negative issues that were, were going to be happening. So having a plan in place beforehand makes, you know, the, the success rate way higher on these cover crops. And the other thing is making sure that you have good resources to lean back on. So if you have a, a mentor of someone that is already doing cover cropping, it makes life so much easier. So that this way you can say, Hey, how are you doing this? How are you doing that? Are you doing, you know, what kind of seeding rates, what species, it makes a, a real big difference in, in once again, success. So once we have our goal set, now we can start talking about species that we're going to be planning on using. And once again, these species, when we start selecting them, we're going to be basing the species selection on our goals, our climate, our logistics, and crop, crop rotation. And all of those will influence which species we, we want to use and which ones we do not want to use. At the end of the day, what we're looking for when we're using these cover crops in our, in our rotation and in our, in our management is number one, we want to increase our plant diversity that we're, we're growing on the land. Number two, we want to, ink, ink, well, we want to make sure that we, we have a green growing plant in the vegetative stage throughout that whole growing season. We want to reduce the amount of tillage we use. We want to reduce the amount of synthetics and if possible, incorporate livestock, get those livestock out on the land. And those are the core soil health principles that I go on. Um, you'll see in, in some of these soil health principles, you'll see about, uh, you know, uh, maintaining soil armor. And I use the soil armor between the, the green growing plant and reducing tillage. If we're reducing amount of tillage, we're going to have more straw laying on the surface and having that green plant. Now we have a, a green armor on top of that soil. So those are the keys that I go on. And it, it's really interesting how the, the, the more of those you incorporate, how that soil then positively responds to it. Uh, in this picture, there's a, a bison producer up in the, the north of, of Lloyd Minister. Um, we, I did up two blends for him about eight years ago. And he said, okay, I got six acres and show me what cover crops can do. He said, be under 75 bucks an acre, but let's see what happens. So this picture was taken uh, in the end of June, end of July, and it was extremely hard to walk through. So we had lots of diversity. We had, you know, the different functional plant groups growing. That um, was one of the years that rained. So he got, had enough rain to, to, to keep those plants growing. And when, when Avery looked at that Google Earth, 
uh, just this past winter, he said, Google Earth, the, the, so this is a few years after he grew this cover crop and then he grazed it off. Six years later, Google Earth, he could still see the results of having that high production, high grazed area in, in uh, sub, uh, the, 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 the uh, subsequent uh, crops that he was growing. So it was, uh, it was really interesting to, to see the, the residual effect of, of that. So increasing the plant diversity and, and uh, having that ma maintain that living root in the soil is really important because number one, when a plant is in the vegetative stage, it will release up to 80% of the carbon it, it captures through photosynthesis as a root exudate. And the more of the root exudates we can be pumping into the soil, that means we're going to be able to keep the biology alive that much longer. When we start adding in different plants, so different functional plant groups, what's going to happen is those different plants are going to have different types of root exudates, which is then going to support a lot of the other uh, biology in the soil. So different types of bacteria, um, uh, other microbes. And so when we, when we have a plant that goes, that changes from the vegetative stage to the reproductive stage, so like our spring cereals, what happens is the, when it goes to the reproductive stage, the root exudates then change. So they're, they're less prone to microbial degradation. So they don't get broken down by the microbes this year. What the plan is, Nate, once again, uh, Dr. Mir, he talks about nature's intelligence, which beautiful phrase. So one of the things that, that the plants do is they have these, these root exudates that are harder for the microbes to break down because it's not setting up for the microbes now, it's setting up for the seed that is in the seed head. So the plant is now setting up the soil so that next spring, the microbes have something to eat. So when those seeds hit the ground and the seedlings start growing, they already have the, some root exudates to feeding the biology to then supply nutrients for that, that young growing plant. So once again, nature's intelligence, uh, unbelievable system once we understand what it's trying to do. When we're looking at cover crops, the, the, the big things I tell people not to do is avoid future green contamination. And so when we look at using something like fall rye, you seed fall rye, and this is in a, a green situation. So if you seed fall rye, and they use a lot of that in the States and they call it cereal rye. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll take their, their soybeans off seed fall rye, it overwinters, they terminate it, they seed the, the corn and everything is, is groovy. Now the problem growing in Western Canada is because we grow a lot of small cereals, what happens if we don't get 100% kill on that fall rye? And that fall rye shows up in our wheat or our barley or our oats, now we have mixed grain, which doesn't pay as well as what uh, a pure crop would, would pay. And it's really hard to clean out. So it's a, a bit of an issue there. For the insect bridges, one of the things we have to watch if we're growing uh, canola or mustard, if we try to incorporate radish into that or, or turnips and seed it in the fall, either before or after, if we seed radishes and turnips in the fall and then we grow canola next year, well, because they're brassicas, those, those turnips and radishes are going to feed your flea beetles. They're going to overwinter underneath that residue of that turnip and radish. When you see the canola, the flea beetles are there, they're hungry, they're going to really damage your, your canola. On the flip side, you harvest your canola and you see turnips and radish. Well, the flea beetles are already there. You harvest your canola, you have your radishes uh, and turnips seeded. Flea beetles are there, they're hungry, they're going to destroy all of your your your, uh, your your seeded seedlings so you have to watch that uh, when we look at the disease vectors and this is going to be things like uh, uh, we can look at uh, rhizoctonia um, pythium things like that so once again if we're growing uh, tight canola in rotation even club root uh, those could be vectors of of some diseases so we have to watch you know making sure we're we're rotating our our functional plant groups and then our antagonism. So basically, allele pathy is the biggest one there. And, and going to go back to fall rye. If uh, 
if we, when we have full rye, there's two air, two times that uh, allelopathy is going to be an issue. Number one, when it's in the vegetative stage, because it's going to be leaking out all these root exudates. And with those root exudates are going to be some allelopathy, allelopathic uh, chemicals in that root exudate, which that is going to suppress any weed growth. And with fall rye and, and allelopathy, it doesn't know the difference between a cover crop and a, uh, and a weed. So if, in order to manage this, it, it's, it's easy to manage or, or relatively easy to manage around, but it does take some, uh, there's going to be some growing pain. So there are going to be some times where, you know, you have the, the fall rye residue or, or the seedlings and you can get the root down below it and it, then your cover crops can be fine. Otherwise, if it's, uh, if the rye gets ahead and, and develops a, a strong allelopathic shield over the field, uh, yeah, it's going to be very difficult to get a, a cover crop established. The other time where allelopathy is, is an issue with fall rye is after harvest. So if you spread the straw, as that straw rots, it will release that more allelopathy back into the soil. So that will come back and bite you. But once again, everything is manageable. It's just knowing what your limitations are before you, you get into them. Now, when we start talking about, uh, you know, the diversity of, of microbes, uh, Dr. Christine Jones, uh, she has a couple of wonderful YouTube uh, videos where she talks about microbe quorums and what she has found and, and it's been replicated through, you know, the Chinook, Chinook Applied Research Association with Dr. Zabella um, and, you know, many producers is that when we grow these cover crops and we have one or two species in it, it's they, they work They're, it's okay where we really start seeing the magic is when we start seeing you know six eight nine ten even ten different species of different functional plant groups growing at the same time this is really when the magic really starts happening and once again it's you know i've i've seen um, some blends that where people are putting in 40 species well, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of, of diversity just because we've we've diluted some of the species maybe down too far that we should be increasing. But um, wonderful thing if you want to get it a little deeper into the microporum, Dr. Christine Jones. So when we start talking about the uh, functional plant groups, one of the, the easy visuals that I, I put together are, I just started out with one triangle where it was grass, legume, and broadleaf. But by definition, the broadleaf is not a grass and not a legume, so they plunked it into the broadleaf. So I broke down the broadleaf into the brassica, non-brassicas, and forb. Within each one of these groups, uh, hopefully we're going to have available warm and, warm and cool season species. Within the warm and cool season species, we'll have annual, biennial, and perennial options. There are some issues, and once again, depending on, on where you're located. So if you're kind of west of Highway 21 in Alberta, uh, growing a lot of warm season, especially legumes, it I think is a waste of time. Uh, just it, we don't have warm enough nights, and it just, they, they falter. And so, and you know, going for the warm season brassica, they, they just aren't there. Or a perennial brassica, they, they just, the it isn't there. So... We want to have is, you know, within the grasses to have, uh, you know, warm and, and warm and cool season species. Absolutely. But then it's, you know, developing these blends to know when to use warm season, when to use cool season, when we're doing blends with both. How does that work? So here we go. <laughs> so with the cover crop blends, we're going to go through these functional plant groups. So with grasses, the, the key role to grasses is biomass. Uh, this is where the, you know, top growth, this is where we get our tons from our grazing days. And they will have, as a rule, a very fibrous root system. So very e expansive. We have lots of choices within this group, both warm and cool season species, uh, annuals, biennials, and perennials. We're growing lots of them already. It's just knowing which group does each, each of the species that we're growing, where does it fit and what is its role? The, the, the nice thing about the grasses is it will accumulate phosphate because of this big fibrous root system. And the other nice thing we, we need to remember is they are, as long as we don't use a, a fungicide seed treatment, they are very mycorrhizal fungi friendly. 
But the problem with grasses is they require nitrogen, nitrogen uh, supplementation. The other problem is, and once again, problem is, is, is the operative word, uh, we already have a lot of grasses in rotation. But the, in a lot of cases, we're dealing with cool season grasses. So how do, we, and, and whether they're annuals or biennials, how do we get more diversity into, the, into our, our rotations? When we deal with the legumes, you know, their claim to fame is fixing nitrogen. Now, normally they have a, a tap root or modified uh, fibrous root system. They tend to be highly mycorrhizal minus to the lupins. And what they do is they'll produce a, a high feed quality when we have them in a rotation or a blend. But the problem with legumes, they are in order to fix that nitrogen, they have a high phosphate requirement. Uh, they have a weak secondary root system. And all of this is back related to being highly mycorrhizal. And the, the mycorrhizae fungi is going to act as extra, extra roots for the legume. And why that's important is when we do mixes and we have a legume and a, and a grass growing together, and both are highly mycorrhizal and we get that my, mycorrhizal infection in both plants, that mycorrhizae will actually link those two plants together so that this way the, the, the grass needs nitrogen, the legume produces nitrogen. So the mycorrhizae can, it can act as the, the translator between the two of them saying, oh yeah, the grass needs nitrogen, the legumes, oh yeah, okay, uh, can we crank up more nitrogen production? Legume says, yeah, but we need more phosphate. And guess what? The grass has extra phosphate. So the mycorrhizae will be able to shuffle phosphate over into the legume to get it into the nodules so they can fix more nitrogen. So, so then they can share some of that nitrogen back to that, that grass. A lot more complicated than that, but that's the Reader's Digest version. The other thing about the legumes is they tend to be early successional plants in, in plant ecology. So they are relatively short-lived. And when Dr. Christine Jones, when she was talking in, in Brandon, Manitoba a couple of years ago, uh, she said the average pasture in the world is 60% forb and 40% grass, which really messed with my brain because she didn't say legumes. But when I was driving home two and a half hours, I was able to think about it. And, and in most pastures, yes, after about you know, six, seven years, most of that legume component starts disappearing. And the whole, once again, nature's intelligence is that legumes will start the process. It'll get the nitrogen going, get the mycorrhizae going. Then they get out of the way for the natural end fixers in the soil. We're going to have, you know, naturally speaking, we're going to have the grazers coming in, grazing it, cycling nutrients, and, uh, you know, making the system work. So now when we start talking about the broadleaves, uh, so the brassica, non brassica and forbs, it's basically, this is where we, we're going to gain a lot of plant diversity. And what we need to think of is the functional plant groups of, you know, what do these different species bring to the table? And uh, so, you know, when you're looking at, you know, things like sunflowers, okay, so the deep taproot, um, the late season pollinator, uh, highly mycorrhizal, good drought tolerance, and, you know, feed value wise uh, for grazing, it's okay, especially if you get the uh, seed head on it. But uh, if you're doing some, some bales or, or silage, uh, unbelievable quality you can get out of, out of things like sunflowers. So now we've gone through those, those quick functional plant groups. Now we can start looking at, you know, once again, these species. So, you know, what are your goals? When are you seeding it? How are you seeding it? What's the weather, climate trends, and our rotation? So when people come to me and they say, what do you think of this blend? Rarely have I seen what I would call a, a wrong blend, but I've seen these blends that have very limited use. So, you know, not enough uh, uh, plant diversity or there's too much of a certain functional plant group that I, I question why, why they, they have that much. So if there's a reason, great, but in most cases, it's, it, it's overrepresented. So on the flip side, I haven't seen a blend that I couldn't have called a couldn't have altered. Even blends I do myself, if you ask me to do up a blend, I'll do up a blend today. You ask me to do up another blend tomorrow and it'll be similar, but it's going to be different. 
and whether it's different, you know, in, in the, in the amount of diversity or, or plant density, but that's all going to depend on how you're going to be. If, if you tell me that, okay, we're, we're going to be broadcasting versus drilling it in, or I'm going to graze it to kill it, or, you know, I want it to die this year, or you change your mind, you want to have it to overwinter. All of those things play in, uh, into account of, of how we're going to be managing this. One of the really interesting uh, uh, trials that Jay Fuhr did at uh, the Mannequin Farms down at Bismarck is he went out to a cover crop blend and he grabbed these different species and he ripped the plants off at the soil surface, bounced it on his finger, and he, he cut it there. And the reason why bouncing on the finger is important because that is 50% of the weight. So 50% is in the top and the 50% is below. When you look at where that is, if you're looking at a typical grass plant, it's going to be about uh, one third is the bottom and two thirds is going to be top because you don't have as much lignin. So when you look at these numbers and you look at the top half of the plant versus the bottom half of the plant, in a lot of cases, your, your protein is higher and relative feed value is better. Your TDN is better. So when we are looking at managing grazing or even cutting for hay, the more residue we leave on the bottom, of the plant, the better off the animals are going to be. We're leaving some soil armor there. We're managing our system a lot better. And so when we're going through and, and uh, you know, looking for maximum tons, at what expense is that? So when we're shaving the ground and getting, you know, all of that annual rye grass, well, the relative feed value is the same, but our protein is significantly lower. So if we just cut that a little bit higher, we're leaving some of the, you know, your, your nitrates, your sulfates, your higher lignin, all of that stuff on in the field to feed the soil biology. And we're dealing with a, a higher feed quality. With that higher feed quality, it's way easier to then, you know, cool it down with a little bit of straw or, or roughage, slew hay or something like that. So it's a real neat uh, just description of, of, of this, how that the how the, 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 the feed values are way higher in the top than the bottom. So go through a couple of scenarios. Uh, these scenarios are, are a couple of years old, so the, the pricing is a little different, but, but uh, again, it gives you an idea of, of how my brain kind of works when we're doing blends. So in scenario number one, we have a 100 acre field, heavy textured uh, soil, moisture is good. We have, uh, we want to see a full season cover crop seeded in late spring. What our goal is we want to cut this for hay, and then we're going to do some fall grazing. And what our problems are, are slow water infiltration. We need hay. We need some fall grazing. We want to build organic matter and we want to terminate when it frees at freeze up. So in this case, we have some Italian ryegrass, we have some Japanese millet, we have some brassine clover, Persian clover, sunflowers, phacelia, and some turnip rape. And one of the things that I'm, my philosophy is, is when we're using these brassicas, especially when there's, you know, brassicas in the area or in your rotation, we don't need much. So just that, that 0.2 pounds an acre is enough for, you know, in this case, when we're dealing with, uh, with a hay, you get too high and then the, the dry down is just, it just takes too long. So, so something like that. So when we start looking at, you know, functionality of this blend, so you put this into that triangle. So the Italian ryegrass is a cool season biennial. Your Japanese melts a warm season annual. Your oats, I forgot down the bottom, we put in 30 pounds of oats. So your oats are a cool season annual. Your brassine clover is a cool season annual. Your Persian clover is a cool season annual. Sunflowers are warm season annual. In your non brassicas in your brassicas, here's your turnip rape, and in your forbs, here's your phacelia. So fairly well diverse first blend. We got it. We have every functional plant group kind of uh, represented. In scenario two, what we're going to do, so it's the same scenario, so 100 acres, heavy texture, good moisture, full season cover crop. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have this over winter. So we're going to do a cut of hay. We're going to get some grazing in the fall with the option of doing some spring grazing. And same, same issues, slow water infiltration, need hay, fall grazing, building organic matter. So in this case, instead of just using Italian ryegrass, we're going to throw some festiolium in. So festiolium is a hybrid between fescue and ryegrass. So we'll keep some Japanese millet in, Persian clover, Persian clover, but now we're going to throw in some sweet clover. So it's a biennial. 
Uh, still that turnip break, but now we're going to throw in some chicory, which is another biennial type of, of plant. And instead of just going with oats, we're going to throw in some winter triticale. So now we have enough of those species in that are going to overwinter to give us uh, some potential, some spring production, or if nothing else, have that living root in the spring so that this way we're going to, you know, get rid of, you know, any, any huge concerns of, of spring, spring or winter erosion or anything like that. So options. Once again, when we look at this, when we look at the functional plant groups, so our Italian ryegrass is that cool season biennial. Now the festiolium is a cool season perennial. Japanese millet still in there, oats, winter triticale is a cool season biennial. Look at the legumes, so the sweet clover is what we added, so cool season biennial. And uh, the other change is the chicory, so we added a warm season biennial into the forbs. So once again, just that next step in, in our diversity. Uh, scenario three, so 100 acres, but now we're going to go to a sand with fair moisture, uh, still looking at cutting and grazing and having something over winter. So the biggest thing you'll see with this blend is we're still using the same species, but we're cutting back the number of seeds per square foot. Because when we start looking at the, the, the ability of that soil to maintain the number of plants growing, we're not going to be able to maintain those the same number of plants. So in the drier parts of the province on poorer soils, we just kind of ease back on on the number of of, speed, of, of uh, seeds per square foot. So in this case, uh, serial number or serial scenario number four, uh, this is going to be a, a cash cropping situation where you know we have some problems. Um, you know, seeding any cereal or broadleaf, we have loam, fair moisture, full season relay cover crop, uh, spring seeded, and we want to reduce weeds and improve water infiltration. So we have slow water infiltration, but there's no livestock. We want to build organic matter, but we want to terminate it when at, uh, at freeze up. So in this case, we'll use in with, in this case, spring triticale, and it can be replaced with any other cereal. So we'll put in some Italian ryegrass and subterranean clover. So the Italian ryegrass, because it's a biennial with poor winter hardiness, it will stay in the vegetative stage right up until the snow flies and will winter kill. Subterranean clover is an annual, late maturing annual clover. I've yet to see it dupes uh, any seed production in, in Saskatchewan in the years that I've been using it. So it will grow, you know, two, two to four centimeters tall and it kind of rosettes out. It'll grow underneath your, your spring cereal. And it'll be there, it'll be fixing nitrogen, building mycorrhizae, good taproot, so it'll help with uh, water infiltration. And once again, be green right up until the snow flies. So it's a low maintenance, easy type of, of uh, relay cover crop to use in, in very, in, in most, most blends. Once again, you don't see the amount of diversity in this, but it sure is better than just growing just one monoculture of, of spring, uh, spring annual. So this relay cover crop that I was, I was mentioned earlier is uh, growing a cover crop underneath your cash crop or your, your, your green feed or whatever your, your main crop. So that when you harvest that main crop, that relay cover crop will continue growing. And so this can be seeded at the same time as your, as your main crop, or if you're, you're still using herbicides after your herbicide application, seed that uh, relay cover crop. So that this way it, it'll hopefully establish underneath your cash crop so that when you harvest it, you'll have something nice and green like what's, what's in this picture. And so once again, the question is, do you want it to freeze and terminate on that first frost or do you want it to continue growing right up until freeze up or do you want it to have it over winter and be there next year? The, the, the right answer is gonna be within what your goals are. So when we're growing these oil seeds and, and cereals, so this Italian ryegrass, uh, this is what it looks like in, in, the, in the fall. So this picture was taken in October. So it's just a, you know, a vegetative plant. And when a plant is green and it's capturing sunlight, it keeps continually pushing root exudates into the soil. When that starts happening, we start building soil because our spring cereals only have those root exudates in the soil when it's in that vegetative stage. So it will only happen... Uh, and, and we're feeding that soil for somewhere between 30 and, and 45 days. 
Whereas we have something green, uh, Dr. Chris Nichols, her challenge for Western Canadian farmers, it's to have something green in our, in our, on our land for somewhere between 240 and 260 days, which is really, really possible just by using stuff like this. If you are using, um, you know, growing a, a, a wheat and you don't want to use Italian ryegrass, you could use something like winter wheat. And once again, just, you know, 10 pounds an acre, but then you have to watch because it will overwinter. And then you, you, know, you really have to manage it so that you, you don't have any, number one, uh, volunteer issues so that this weed doesn't go to seed on you in, in your oats or wheat if you're, if you're going for, for those markets. And uh, if you are going back to wheat again, um, there could be some, some disease issues that you'd be uh, continuing on in, in year two. So the, the other option you can do is you can seed some of these, these low growing clovers. You can seed those extremely early in the spring so that what you're doing or you know, even into the frost. So you can go out and you can seed these clovers, they're gonna germinate, they're gonna start growing. And so they'll grow through, you know, through April into the first part of May, then you can seed your cash crop straight into it. So now we're doing this, the process, what they, they call in the States planting green. So those plants are there, they're, they're fixing nitrogen, uh, they're starting to build a mycorrhizae, then when you seed your, 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 your cash crop into it, that soil is all already alive. And it's, it, when those seedlings hit, the, hit the ground, uh, you know, get, get the ground running, uh, they're, they're going to establish really, really quickly. So uh, the negative is you have to watch, you know, seeding uh, something that is a high water user, it can dry out that that top soil. So that's, that's the, the downside of it. Uh, the, the other option with it is, yeah, uh, either seeding it with the cereal or, or seeding it after, after herbicide application. So when we're looking at these cover crop blends, you have to remember that diversity is more important than density of each species. And that's to a point, because once again, when I talked about having 40 species in and you know a cover crop blend, you're gonna be looking at 35 seeds per square foot, for example, you're not even getting one seed per square foot of each of the species. So you're better off to go back. So you know when we're looking at that diversity and you say you're gonna be putting in oats, barley, wheat, triticale, well, those are four cool season annuals. Do you need all four of them? Or is it better to focus in on, you know, two of those and simplifying it somewhat? The other thing we have to remember is that soil and the climate only support so many plants per square foot. So, you know, going at uh, 60 seeds per square foot, unless you're in the, the, the Westlock area or something with real good fertility, uh, good rain, maybe you know cutting it back and being in that 45 to 50 range whereas if you're out in uh in seven persons uh being in that 25 is maybe going to be more realistic uh the the quick rule of thumb when we're doing these mixes whatever you use as your your main species in your mix you what you want to do so for if you're seeding oats and you're aiming for 30 seeds per square foot what you want to do is if you're using oats as the main look at about 120% of that monoculture total. So 30, 30 seeds per square foot, 120% of that is, is 36. So maybe cut the oats back a little bit and add, add this diversity. And when we're looking at doing these relay cover crops, what we may have to do is reduce the seeding rate of our cash crops. We normally seed at high seeding rates for our cash crops because what we want to do is have competition. We want to suppress weeds. In this case, we're going to be using these relay cover crops to do the same thing, but we're going to do it better. We're going to be having something in that vegetative stage, release, releasing root exudates into the soil. We're going to be building soil with these things. So cutting the seeding rate of that, that cash crop, and maybe even, you know, if you have the opportunity to go to wider rows, maybe that's a, another opportunity to, to be looking at. But at the end of the day, what we want to do and what I do is I'm thinking both above ground and below ground. I want to be able to have this diversity fill up that whole canopy above ground. And when, when I'm looking at below ground, I want to be thinking about, you know, which ones are tap roots, which ones are fibrous, which ones are the warm season species, cool season species, the annuals, biennials, because that's all going to be accelerating how we build soil. 
So, you know, there's some really neat graphics out there on the internet where, you know, they'll give you some, some suggestions on how these, these roots are supposed to grow. And when we start looking at hard pants and, and tough soils, they're not going to be ideal picture perfect. But what we can do is this is where we want to be. This is, these are the species we want. So, you know, if we have this hard pan and, you know, if we have these biennials growing the first year, it may be just sitting on top of that hard pan, but when we actually get some moisture into them, because in, in North America, we have these two to one swelling clays, as soon as they get some moisture, we'll be able to get that biennial through that hard pan. And we can, once again, start fixing these soils. The other thing when, when, when we're looking at these blends, you know, we want to think of these plant tolerances. So which species will tolerate hot, which ones will tolerate cold, which ones will tolerate dry, which ones will tolerate wet. Those are the things we want because, you know, unless you, you know, listen to Drew Lerner or have, uh, you know, pig sl uh, spleens or something where you can get a real good idea of what's coming, uh, we need to have that diversity. And so, you know, these are the things we want. So it, it may be something where we, you know, we put a little bit of teff grass into, into our mixes and it may never, like for, for three years, it may never show up, but in year four conditions are right that it starts expressing itself. So that's, you know, one of the things to, to be looking at. The other thing we need to do is keep, you know, one plant uh, or maybe more uh, that uh, one of those plants stays in that vegetative stage throughout that whole growing season. It's crucial in building soil. Uh, Cotswold Seeds is a company based out of England. Uh, they have a great website. They have uh, some, some nice charts like this, so that this way you need a little bit of translator on some of it. So if you're, you're not familiar, Lucerin is alfalfa. And if you see Coxfoot, that's, that's orchard grass. But it really gives you a, a really good idea of you know, the rooting depth on, on some of these species and whether they're fibrous or they're, they're top root. Uh, really neat way to look at you know, above ground, below ground. With these cover crops, take a look at your rotation and ask yourself, how can you add diversity to these mixes? You know, look what functional plant groups are you using right now. Are we looking at warm season, cool season, annual, biennials, and perennials? What kind of root systems do they have? My key goals when I'm doing blends is I want to make sure that I have an active growing root in that system of that plant in the vegetative stage uh, uh, and keeping that going as long as we can and increasing that plant diversity. So if you, if you do anything this coming year and to, to take that first step forward, vegetative plant, uh, make sure there's something green growing as for as many days as we can. And once again, Dr. Chris Nichols, she said the importance of it is as we build soil structure through the growing season, we need to have something green, a carbon input late in the season because the microbes will then, as the soil starts cooling, will start weatherproofing their, their homes, their, their soil aggregates. When they have this waterproofing around the soil aggregates, as we go through winter and in the spring, when we get that, that uh, the spring runoff, that because we've waterproofed it, now we're going to retain a lot of that, that soil aggregate going into spring. If we don't, if we do what we have been, what will happen is those aggregates we built all summer will fall apart in the spring. They'll slake. So it's really important to, you know, when we're building these houses, no sense knocking it down every year. Let's keep building onto it. So when we're going through this and, and uh, as you start getting into Regen Ag and, and using cover crops and all the other, the, the tools we have within Regen Ag, don't worry about criticism from people you wouldn't seek advice from. So that when the fertilizer dealer is telling you that this doesn't work and uh, it, it's, it's dumb and it's going to fail, did, did you remember asking him? <laughs> would be the first question that I would ask. So as a, a shameless plug, if anybody is interested, I did write a book a couple of years ago. Uh, it's available through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Friesen Press. If you want digital, you can get it through Apple Books, uh, Google Play, Kindle, Friesen Press, or if you just send me an email or text, uh, I, can, I can send one out to you for $45, including the mailing. So. so there's my contact information. I am available for, uh, for discussion if anybody is... is is uh, is inter interested in, in doing further discussions and 
you know, just seeing, you know, what your what if you what I think of your plan. Uh, once again, um, <laughs> maybe you're not going to ask me because you, you're not going to ask for my opinion, but I'm here for for support. So if anybody has uh, any any questions, I'm uh, I'm I don't have any other appointments for the next hour, so I'll be here for discussion. And I see there's 22 chats on yeah. here. So <laughs> I have some questions to ask you, Kevin, from from the chat. Just think little little questions that came up during um, during the presentation. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll 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 go through the chat box and ask them, and then also um, if anybody has a question that you want to ask Kevin directly, just unmute yourself and interrupt us and um, and ask away. So the first question, I just have to scroll through here because there was we had a really active chat box for this presentation. It was good, lots of questions flying around. Um, so okay, are there any perennial cover crops that can be used in orchard setting? Um, to help control weeds and return nutrients to fruit producing plants? Excellent question. Uh, I'm doing a lot more uh, uh, coaching in the orchard situation. And uh, it, it, once again, it's, it's as, as simple as, as you want to make it. So once again, what are your goals? What are you trying to do? And once again, it, it's competition that, that everybody goes back to. So if you remember back to mycorrhizal plants, if you have mycorrhizal plants growing and, and trees have a different mycorrhizae system than what grasses and, and legumes do, similar but slightly different. Sometimes they're compatible, sometimes they're not. But the, the quick rule of thumb is if we go in and use something uh, as if you're looking for an annual using things like the Italian ryegrass and subterranean clover, it's a low maintenance rollway type of of scenario so whether it's market gardens um, trees where you just want to have something green growing in these these rows where if you, you don't want to be tilling you don't want to be spraying easy easy peasy when we get into the perennials so you know you want to see it down you want to leave it and you you know just want to keep it low maintenance now we can start looking at uh, things like hard fescue, sheep's fescue as, as a grass and use something like the white Dutch clover. So that this way it's there, it stays low growing, it's low maintenance, it doesn't use a lot of water, doesn't use a lot of nutrients, uh, easy to maintain because you just run over the mower every once in a while if it does get a little too tall for you or you know that, that, if that first year, maybe there's some weeds coming. But once again, we can use some successional plants. So that first year, instead of just going with hard fescue and white Dutch clover, let's throw some Italian ryegrass in. Let's throw in a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of, of subterranean clover. And if we're dealing with hard pan issues, let's throw in a little bit of chicory. Uh, first year, it's gonna stay nice and low. Next year, it's gonna grow up, you know, four or five feet tall hollow stems so it you know once again it, it's going to do more good than, than than damage so um i hope that answered that question there are options yeah there's a follow-up to that question um so as a follow-up which cover crops um should be good to work in clay gray loam type of soils okay so now it's it's going back to goals so you know what cover crops are you using for for clay we can use a lot of different ones. What is the matrix that you're measuring success on? So are you looking at, you know, water infiltration? Are you looking at uh, soil aggregation? Are you looking nitrogen fixate? What is the matrix that we're, we're trying to fix? Once we find out what your goals are, what your, your problems are, now we can come up with, with solution. Uh, it's, uh, I like the joke of, of uh, a person went to the doctor and said, doctor, it hurts when I touch my head. It hurts when I touch my side. It hurts when I touch my leg. What's wrong? Doctor said, well, you have a broken finger. <laughs> so sometimes the, 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 the solutions are usually right in front of us. We just got to, we have to understand what our problems are. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, that's, that, that's my follow-up question. So to come up and, and say, oh, uh, this is the blend. Well, it, it would be, wouldn't be uh, 
in either one of our best interests for me just to come up with, you know, oh, this is the blend to use in clay, because I don't know what your issues, what issues you're looking at. Okay. So it takes time to go through, <laughs> but it's something if, if you're interested in, 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 you know, uh, putting together these goals, if you go to www.covercrops.ca, so I'll just put it in here. Yeah, put it in the chat. Let's see. Hey, there we go. Uh, if you go to that, uh, on there, there is a, a, a little square in the corner, and it is the cover crop assessment sheet. And these are the questions that I'm going to be asking you based, you know, directly and directly. But it's a great tool in my mind to as a starting point to say, okay, what are my goals? What am I trying to do? And the real neat thing about this whole scenario and, you know, whether you call it cover copper regen egg or whatever title you want to call it, when we are looking at all of the problems we have in agriculture today, the take home message is, and, and the solution to all of this directly, indirectly is getting more functional carbon, active carbon in our soils when we get functional carbon in our soils, our problems disappear. And it's, it's, it's intimidating. Like I said, the first step is the scariest because where do I start? But if you have that green growing plant in the vegetative stage for as many days as you can, and that's the only thing that you do and you don't have livestock and, and uh, you're not short circuiting the, the, the system, we're better, we're better off. Okay, great question, great answer. <laughs> um, we have another question here. Maybe I'm sensing a common theme, we'll see. Um, any cover crops that can be used to plant over top untouched prairie? I have a plot that's not used and I can't get equipment in to till it, but I can get smaller equipment to convert it into an orchard. Oh yeah, uh, good question, and and this is where if you if you listen to some of uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham's work, um, she'll talk about plant succession, and one of the things that we look at is well, the two things that we look at is your fungal bacteria ratio, and your carbon to nitrogen ratio. So in native prairies, it requires a higher fungal component in that for these native species to thrive. Now, the key is once we get too fungal, and once again, that two is, is, is in quotes, because when we have that ratio too high, then we start seeing rose bushes, we see the, the woody uh, forbs starting to show up. And that's an indication that that ratio is now too high. But in reality, our fungal is still okay. It's our bacterial levels are just so low. When we're looking at seeding orchards, and trees, they want to be up in that higher fungal bacteria ratio. So if we're looking at planting trees into it, uh, it'll be well suited. Uh, one of the things that uh, there's a book called uh, Mycorrhizal Planet by Michael Phelps. Uh, awesome read. And one of the things that he suggested is whenever we're planting trees, if you go to an area that is growing trees, so if we're going into, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be planting a shelter belt and, you know, we have this good black follow, nice clean. If we plant evergreens in there, most likely we're going to have a lot of, a lot of death, very poor, very slow establishment. But if you go out to a, a spruce, native spruce front and you collect some soil from that uh, underneath those trees, when you dig a hole in that, you know, in that area where you're going to be planting the, these seedlings, if you throw a couple of handfuls of soil from underneath a pine tree into the bottom of the hole, then you put your, your sapling, then you put your soil back in, your trees are going to establish way quicker because we put the biology that that plant needs into the hole. So we've transplanted. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
So uh, to mm. put trees into it, absolutely. But now we have to look at, you know, what species we're putting in, where's your, your, you know, how sod bound is it? What species are growing? Are they sod forming? Are they, are they bunch grasses? Um, and how much more nitrogen do we have to add to the system? So we may have to add something like a, a subterranean clover to get more nitrogen going, so. Okay. And is there a minimum recommended height for cutting and grazing? Like is minimum six inches left or anything? <laughs> okay, here we go with the rule of thumb. Um, that's where when you're grazing, uh, to have that uh, graze 50%, leave 50% during the growing season. It's a great way to, once again, eyeball. So when you rip that plant out at the surface and you balance it on your finger, there's your your eyeball of where you want to be and when you've grazed it down to there have that back fence in there so the animals can't go back and graze it again because those plants that regrowth is going to be higher sugar which is going to be more attractive to those animals so uh, so so some of that management um, you know how low do you graze it well, the, the more you can leave for that lower part of the plant, the more you allow that plant to grow and stockpile, then graze down again, but then pull them off quickly, we're going to be maintaining a, a healthy root system. Once we start grazing and cutting past 50%, those roots will stop growing for about two weeks. So, you know, when we're dealing with 120 growing days or 100 growing days, whatever it is, and we take 14 days off of that, that number is too big. So the, the quicker we move the animals through, the better off those plants are gonna be long-term. The other thing that we have to look at is when we have the, uh, you know, the, these perennials, uh, there's some work done by Clayton Robbins and he suggests that we should never graze our perennials through August, September, October because at that time, those plants are trying to build up the nutrient and, 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 and uh, carbohydrate reserves in their, in their root systems. Anytime that we're grazing or cutting that time of year, we're forcing it to regrow and it's taking carbohydrate out of the root system. So it's weakening that root system. And this is where, once again, these cover crops, these are you know, annuals and biennials, they're destined to die. So if we're going to abuse something, let's abuse that. Let's maintain our perennials in the best shape as we can. Mm -hmm. So there's, once again, rule of thumb, not really. Um, but yet on the flip side, when we have these perennials and, uh, you know, we have some really good growth after freeze up and these plants go dormant, fall graze them, you can graze them fairly hard and get rid of that, that old growth or, you know, stockpile it for spring. Uh, then you can graze it down and because with trees, trees lose their leaves. So the sunlight can get down to the bottom of the tree with grasses. If we always have this thick thatch on it, the, the regrowth is, is really poor. So during the growing season, graze half, leave half in through the winter, or early spring, graze it down. And then this way you've, you've, you're allowing that sunlight and nutrients and water to, to get down and, and get that, that those, those perennials growing. And okay, next question. There's a lot of questions flying into the chat box. So I'll just go down the list and we'll, we'll um, keep tackling them. Um, is it worth it to have wildflowers and native plants to use as cover crop? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, another story, <laughs> I've got stories. That's okay. Um, so oh, it, it all puts it in perspective, and that's what I love about it. And so back, I don't know how many years ago, uh, what they did is they trapped wolves and they released them into Yellowstone National Park. Made people really upset because, you know, that's a predator. Why are you introducing a predator into the system? Because, you know, the bison, they would hunker down into these big meadows. And if you want to see bison, you go there because they're always there. Well, when they introduced the bison what they, or the bison, when they were introduced the wolves into it, now the bison have a predator. So what is, if you have a predator, what are you going to do? You're going to be moving. You don't want to be in the same spot. You don't want to be predictable because the predators learn and they'll be picking you off. So that forced these bison to leave these meadows and, and, and in, in basically rest these areas. 
And what they found was after two or three years, there was a bunch of wildflowers that they thought were extinct showing up in these meadows. Mm -hmm. So that when, you know, when I'm going through and I'm developing these blends and having, you know, facilia and having some forbs in and, and, you know, whether it's pollinators or, 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 you know, designed for pollinators or not, when we start seeing some of these other forbs starting to show up, that's when we know things are starting to crank. And once again, uh, in, in, in modern agricultural systems, what do we have for flowers um, that a non-economical flower that we're growing? So you can argue that canola and flax, uh, sunflowers, but then you start running out of species in a hurry. When we start throwing in these pollinators, one of the things you'll find is now we're going to have more predator insects starting to show up. Uh, another really good book that I, I recommend is Farm is Ecosystem. Um, uh, Jerry Benetti is, is the author of that. He passed away a couple of years ago, but an awesome book. And one of the things that he suggests that if you take these fields of 640 acres or 160 acres, you break it down to 40 and 50 acres with some permanent strips for, for insect refuges, a lot of our insect outbreaks would disappear now. So I find that as, as really interesting because on our farm, that's what we did. We had 40 and 50 acre fields. Um, it was a bit of pain if you had big equipment, but with our, our old junk, um, it worked really well. And on our farm, we didn't have insect outbreaks. And so this is part of what I attributed to is, um, you know, especially when we started growing one of these cover crops, because you, you see this picture behind me, you want to see a pollinator blend? Well, <laughs> the, the, the the bees and the pollinators just went crazy in there. But uh, this is, these are the things that, that, that we found. So I read, when I read the book, it just kind of put the pieces together that uh, it all made sense. Mm -hmm. So here's another question. Um, these are two separate questions, but I'm going to combine them. So I assume these concepts can be easily applied to smaller spaces, home gardens. And if so, where can we source cover crop seeds or blends in smaller quantities for like the home garden or hobby farmer type person? Yeah, that's uh, once again, a real good question. Um, through, through Imperial Seeds, this is one of the things we've identified is, is this market. But because the the agricultural market is literally exploding. Um, it, it's, yeah, it, we've, we've identified it, haven't really addressed it per se. On the flip side, if you talk to a local retailer, uh, you know, some of them have identified it. So if you, you're wanting to have, you know, a, a package of, of seed, they would just go in grab a handful of what they're using and, and hopefully it, it works. On the flip side, uh, on last Monday, I did a webinar with West Coast Seeds, and they're trying to focus more in on it. Mm -hmm. So it is it is a, a growing market. Um, so yeah, talk to if you if you're interested in in through you know once again, I I, I get paid by Imperial Seeds. So if you want to get a hold of uh, of Imperial Seed and find out where the local retailer is and and get something through them or you know you can do some google searching on online the thing you have to watch is adaptability so that you know some of these species and and you know goal setting so you'll see some of these these wild latin names what do they do what's their what's their growth pattern what's their root system do they persist all of those things so we're not going to create a problem like uh, I know in the past one of the we, we used to deal with a, a wildflower mix and to make it cheap they use baby breath and if you didn't manage it properly the next year it's all baby breath so watching the species is, is fairly important okay we have, oh, I hope we get through all the questions. I thought like we'd have lots of time after this to go through everything. And now I'm, I'm worrying, but we'll try and go through every question that's on the chat here. Um, so is there any species that tolerate cold nights, but hot days? Any suggestions for that? Uh, I, I guess I need some clarification on that is hot when and cold when. <laughs> so yeah, um, if it's 
I can maybe ask if Lee Liebman is still on the call, if you want to clarify, that was uh, Lee's question. I'm not sure if Lee's still here or if he signed off, but if you want to unmute yourself and clarify, that would be very helpful. We'll see. Because the whole thing goes back to context. So yeah. if you're looking for, you know, just in general, it mm -hmm. likes hot and it tolerates cold, high alpine desert. Uh, so if you're yeah the high alpine alpine desert um so using you know some of the brassicas or some of the the most frost tolerant so they'll, they'll take you know temperatures down to minus nine continue growing uh going in with things like uh, uh the italian ryegrass any of the biennials uh once again they'll they'll take the heat but yet because they're a biennial they have to have some frost tolerance so that this way they'll be able to keep on chugging once again depending on what your context is so if you're looking for you know just sheer biomass so you want something that'll grow you know two meters tall yeah, that's going to be really scary but if you're looking at uh you know ground cover you're looking at uh, soil improvement uh, th there's there's a lot of species that kind of fit the fit the mold mm -hmm. and it could be something where they go dormant during the heat and then get going again when it's cool or vice versa so a little more diversity and, and you'll have it uh have it covered okay okay so here's another question um how does one increase the chance of successful cover crop when converting traditional monocropped fields so this is decades of synthetics um to organic forage soil building cover crop okay um the thing that i highly recommend for going from conventional high input to organic is a, a short-term perennial once again lots of diversity but by doing that um you know and, and having species that only last for you know whether they're biennials or or short-term perennials uh what it does is it it takes a lot of the pressure off so that this way you know when we look at you know reducing the use of synthetics okay boom we're right there uh increasing plant diversity boom we're there uh, reducing tillage, boom, we're there. Now to terminate it, that's going to be a little bit of a, a challenge. But as Nicole Masters says, every time you do a sin against a soil, you make two reparations. So when we have it, you know, using some of these biennial mixes in, we're, we're doing a lot of good for the soil. So to do a little bit of tillage, and once again, the keyword is, is little, as the one organic producer told me, he does surgical tillage. I said, ooh, ooh, tell me more. And he said, okay, so if you were going to be taking, if, if, if you had appendicitis and they have to take your appendix out, they don't start cutting at the shoulder and, and cutting down. They make a small incision, they go in, they take the appendix out, they sew you up and the least damage possible. And this is what he was doing in, in his operation is, you know, if there was ruts, if there was, you know, some issue to, to do tillage. Okay. So what was, what would be the least amount of damage he can do doing tillage? Mm -hmm. So it, it was an interesting, uh, interesting concept uh, for, for looking at. So by, by doing the biennial, so the chicory, uh, maybe the plantain, some winter cereals, some, and then incorporating the animals. Uh, in, in my mind, that's what I would, I would want to do. Uh, on, on our farm, what I was planning on doing uh, is we, wrote, we were winter grazing bison on our farm. I uh, didn't own them. I was borrowing them and getting paid to, to do the grazing. But the plan was is to keep the, the the stand, you know, rotating the animals through. And then once we went through, you know, three to five years of doing that, then I would start breaking up 40 acre pieces and then farming that organically, farm it for three to five years, and then move on to the to the next piece where I'd break up. I would see that back down to a short-term perennial. That was what my goal was. And when you do that. Once again, it's you're dealing with with native soil again. Uh, it's it's rich. The the biology is there. It's it's diverse. It's it's functioning. So hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> um, okay, so so if you use a cover crop the first year, then you don't have to use fertilizer. There's a question for you, mm. or maybe a clarification. 
So when when I was listening to uh, uh, Dr. Jones, that was one of the questions I said, okay, so I've been doing this, you know, telling her what my, my rotation was, the species I was using. She said, okay, awesome diversity. And when you have, uh, you know, developing this system and you're, you have uh, a legume and a grass, and if you have been putting on any background phosphate fertilizers in the past, basically she says, uh, and, and there's, there's data to prove it, that uh, phosphate fertilizer use efficiency runs about 15%. So if you put down one years of, pho of phosphate, you get about nine years of residual out of it. And if you uh, if you want to get to the next level, once again, I talked to Dr. Zavala out of out of Oyen, and and now she's going to start doing what they call a sparks test, which is a mineralogical test. So instead of telling you what the plants can take out of the soil, it tells you the full amount. And Dr. Uh, Elaine Ingham, what one of the things that she was talking about was. In our soils in, in Western Canada, we have between 1,500 and 2,500 years of phosphate in our soils. If we go through and we build mycorrhizae and we have micro, good mycorrhizal activity in the soil, we have that grass legume and maybe a forb supporting the mycorrhizae, we can cut phosphate, and, well, fungicides, number one. Number two, Cut your phosphate out. When we start talking about nitrogen, the uh, the, the first question that we're going to have to look at is where is organic matter? Because when you look at a soil test, one of the things that they'll show you is your ENR, so estimated nitrogen release, and that's based on your organic matter in your soil. So if you're dealing with one percent organic matter, chances of you being able to cut back to zero nitrogen in year one or year two can be done but it takes going to take a lot of management and so if the the nice thing with with you know using these legumes and fixing nitrogen building organic matter and if you decide okay let's see if we can cut it back to zero there are some really neat things that that you can do uh, patrick fabian down at tilly alberta he's been um, working with foliar applying melted 4600 so it makes an 1800 mix because it's in the urea phase it will not do leaf burn so you can apply it right onto the leaf foliar so if you if you decide you're going to go with zero n and oops uh i have nitrogen deficiencies or you do a tissue test and i'm i'm, I'm low you can go in and use this and the nice thing with it is it's four times more efficient than putting it into the soil so really cheap way of getting nitrogen into the plant. You may have to do two or three passes during that growing season. But number one, it's way cheaper. Number two, we're reducing the salt load. And it, it, yeah, it just makes, makes dollars and cents for you. So for the, the rest of the nutrients, uh, by having you know, these deep tap roots, uh, bringing up nutrients, having the, the, the mycorrhizae going, it's going to be sharing water, nutrients, all of these, these good things that these plants need to grow. So that helps that whole system function. So if we're all dealing with fiber, shallow root systems, yeah, we're going to have to be, you know, weaning ourselves off of these systems, off of the, the, uh, the, the chemical inputs. If we get in with tap roots and having the diversity, we can get off of the, the input uh, merry-go-round fairly quickly. Nice. Um, so here's here's a question, um, but I think we answered it earlier on. So where do we get cover crop seeds and the correct types for purpose? So you mentioned Imperial Seeds is a good place to source seeds and also Cover Crops Canada. I think you put the website for that, um, the assessment sheet, right? Would those be good starting points? Well, Cover Crops Canada, we don't sell seed, uh, but basically most of the seed houses have um, a, a portion of their business as cover crops. So everybody covers cover crops, but it's going to be up to you to identify what you need. So that this way, if they, um, it, once again, if you're looking for uh, nitrogen fixation and you get a high brassica blend, it's a scavenger. So it's not going to fix nitrogen. It's just going to recapture the nitrogen in your soil. So it's, once again, starting point is setting your goals. 
what do you want to do? Then go shop around, find out what, uh, what your local supplier has, has access to, or go to Google or go to Amazon or whatever you want to go to and find out what's available. And then, you know, being able to, to piece this together and, you know, in, it, it, what what really intrigued me is when I first got into this and I went to Cabela's and they have these deer blends that uh, hunters will seed down. And I looked at what the price was of this small little bag and it turned out to be about eight times more expensive than what we could do as, uh, as, as just a, a, a sheep blend. That's quite the markup. So it's once again. <laughs> exactly. And once again, because it is for recreation, yeah. there's no budget. Whereas if it is, you're trying to have an operation and you're trying to feed animals. Okay. So now we're watching the dollars and cents and seeing, you know, where the, where it is. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, doing a little bit of homework. If you, you know, once again, if you need assistance on, on putting stuff together uh, for, for a blender for ideas, absolutely get a hold of me and we can, we can go through setting, setting up. And, and even if it is just helping setting what your goals are, like if uh, you know, why is this weed growing? Uh, it, it's really interesting. and so predictable on how and what weeds are growing. Mm-hmm. So that when you have this, uh, you know, uh, when you have stinkweed growing, okay, that tells me that this is, or this isn't happening in the soil. When you see dandelions showing up, that tells me something else. And so when we see dandelions, we want to try and pick a plant that's going to replace that function in our mixes so that we either delay it showing up or the plant says, oh, you're under control. We don't have to worry about showing up and, and helping fix the soil. Yeah. So can you add plant diversity without working up grass pasture? That's the first question I ask is how sod, like how much sod built up is it and how much black soil? So if it's sod bound to add diversity into it, when you, if you did a soil test on it, your nitrate in that soil would be close to zero. If you uh, were able to get the, the, the carbon to nitrogen ratio in it, it would be, you know, probably 15, 16. And so in the soil, a, a functioning agricultural soil will be in that 12 to 13 range, carbon to nitrogen. So what that implication is, is that when you have any nitrogen, when you're at a 15 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, and if that soil needs to, in order to be actively functioning back in that 13 range, any nitrogen that you put into it, the plants won't see it until that carbon to nitrogen ratio is down into that 13 range. So when we have a, a native stand and we're trying to, to rejuvenate it, uh, so your, your fungal, the bacteria ratio is fairly high. We want to try and get more nitrogen into that system. We want to get more bacteria happening to get that, that, uh, that functionality back in and more diversity. The other really neat thing is uh, uh, John Kemp wrote a book called Quality Agriculture. And one of the people he interviewed was Tom Dykstra. And one of the things that he talks about is when he has some of his clients that has you know, fields or parts of the field that have low productivity. What he recommends is to go in and apply one pound of sugar per acre per week. And what that does is it puts fresh carbon because sugar is C6H12O6. So because you're putting it into a liquid form, you're spraying it on, that's going into the soil and your bacteria once they get it and they get fed, their populations can increase tenfold in four days. So they're very responsive to adding nutrients or food source for them. When we have this low diversity and and stagnant soils, basically what's happened is our bacteria populations have dropped because our root exudates have dropped. When we can go in and add that carbon source, and so, you know, do we we get in with a, a, a industrial, and seed uh, an annual in there that's going to grow and, and put fresh root exudates in the soil. Do we go in with sugar? Do we put non-sulfonated uh, molasses? Do we put legumes? These are the strategies we can look at. 
But when we do that, we have to make sure that we're not going to be needing something that is going to be a high nitrogen user. We need to either fix nitrogen or find some way of getting those that that fresh active carbon back into that soil. Okay, how are you doing for time, Kevin? You still have time to answer a few more questions. I have an hour and a half. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, well, you hopefully we won't take that long, but we'll see. Maybe. We'll <laughs> I don't know. So, what are your thoughts on finishing cattle on cover crops? Um, if good, are there any preferred cover crop blends for finishing? Yeah, that that's the other thing. I'm you know I'm working with a dairy right now. Well, I've been eight years, and we are formulating uh, silage blends for dairies so that we have taken his, uh, he was using two semi loads of barley a month. Now we're down to one per year. And his canola meal, he was, uh, I think one a month and we're half a load a year now. His production, milk production went up, his milk fat went up and we cut his, uh, his feed cost by 50%. Wow. So if we can do that with dairies, with beef, absolutely. And so when I was talking to Paul, I asked him, I said, okay, so what are your goals? He said, I need a, a formulation for dry cows, for heifers, and for milking cows. And so we did up three different blends for them. And uh, we actually overshot the quality a little bit. And once again, there is very little starch in these, in these uh, rations. Because when we're looking, and this is the, the next thing, and I don't know if anybody's on here that wants to shoot me, but if we're, if we're talking regen ag, it'll make more sense. We need to get starch out of animal, out of, out of ruminants. Starch, there's no ruminant out there in the wild that I know that eats high starch diet in the wild. We need to go back to water soluble carbohydrate. And when we do that, now, uh, well, going back to Paul, we had, uh, he had issues, you know, back in the day when he was feeding uh, corn silage and alfalfa and, you know, really high octane feed. If he disappeared for a week and, you know, went to a conference or, you know, go visit friends or whatever, when he came back, there was dead cows all over the place. And there's a condition in, in dairy called bloody gut syndrome where their innards just basically fall apart. And, you know, basically, once we got them away from starch and got them into water soluble carbohydrate, all those problems disappeared. And then, you know, the, the nutritionist, they, uh, they were confused because they said they can't correlate their feed test to the animal production, which is, you know, once again, really neat. Um, so when we're going through and we're, we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, can we finish beef on these? It's going back to, you know, looking at what plants do we need? What does the, the animal need? Um, and, you know, the, and then how are we going to feed it? And this is where that, that nice green sheet that I, that uh, the slide that I had up, if we're eating the top half of the plant and leaving the bottom half of the plant, this is where we get the biggest, biggest gains. Uh, that's where the most sugar is. Uh, um, just everything about it is just a more natural system. Right. And what do you recommend for building soil on newly cleared land? So the previous ecosystem was boreal forest, so 95% spruce in a, uh, in a zone one climate. So what would you recommend? There? Ah, there's, uh, this, is, this is what I love about what I do. There's, uh, I, I never know what the next question is going to be. So, <laughs> I know. Okay, so we're going to go. Rapid fire too. <laughs> <laughs> So when we look at, uh, and once again, when you can go on uh, Elaine Ingham's, uh, uh, any of her presentations, she talks about this fungal bacteria ratio. So when we get over that one-to-one -one fungal bacteria ratio, so we're now we're transitioning from, from grasses and, and, uh, and legumes, and we start getting into shrubs, and that's about a two-to-one, five-to-one. When we get to 10-to-one, this is where the poplars start showing up. And we get the 100-to-one fungal bacteria ratio. This is where the, the uh, evergreens start showing up. So when we have this, this highly fungal program, and you know, your pH is going to be a bit lower, 
um, you know, there's, there's going to be, <laughs> uh, it isn't something where it, when you're walking through a spruce run, you don't see canola plants, you don't see oats, you don't see the things that we're, we're trying to grow. So when we go in, we, we scrub it and we do some tillage. The tillage is going to damage a lot of your, your fungi, but it's also going to wake up a lot more of the bacteria. So once again, uh, your, when we have a high fungal uh, system, a lot of our nitrogen is going to be in the ammonium stage uh, or state, which a lot of weeds can't grow. So as we do tillage, as we do, uh, you know, spray it, as we, that keeps promoting more and more bacteria. So when we start seeing, um, so after you scrub it, you know, you're going to start seeing some rose bush show up, you'll show, uh, you'll see some of these shrubs. So that's an indication. Now you went from a hundred to one down to two to one. So if you do once again, nasty, but you, you do a little more tillage, you get it prepared. You, 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 what you want is to start producing more plants that are more bacterial, uh, producing so tighter carbon to nitrogen ratios so if you're growing some some turnips and some you know a lot of green stuff that will help promote a lot of uh, of, of bacteria growth and when that bacteria growth starts increasing now we start balancing that that fungal bacteria ratio getting things going and which is uh, you know when when we have plants rotting in the soil releasing nutrients promoting bacteria it's a lot friendlier to the whole system than going out and you know going out with a the plow and the disker and 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 damaging the the system okay so can you speak to the use of compost for establishing a healthy soil food web Okay, compost. So one of the things that you always have to watch if you're going to be getting into composting is number one, make sure you take courses and you have a mentor so that the worst thing you can do is you're working on compost and have something that is actually toxic. So you have lots of E. coli, you have lots of negative things in it. So make sure you get it tested, make sure you, you do analysis on it before you actually start using it. So the composting, you know, the, it's an awesome source to be able to get um, more carbon, more diverse carbon, some biology, active biology into your soils. So, and that's the part of that whole eye mindset of going out to a spruce run, grabbing soil from underneath a spruce tree. And when you're, you know, planting these seedlings, throwing in that that soil in underneath that sapling so that this way it's it's a taste of home mm -hmm. so the composting absolutely um it's a lot of it can be a lot of work uh the johnson sioux reactors are are really good but they're slow um but they do produce a, a real good quality type of of compost with not a lot of uh, of maintenance of of turning and and watching temperatures, all those things. So uh, so yeah, it's once again another tool in the toolbox, and and having too many tools in the toolbox, I, <laughs> you can never have too many, just as long as you're using it properly. So this isn't a question, but I thought since you've answered all the questions so far, you might it might be nice to hear. Um, just a comment from Kelly in the chat box saying this familiarity and knowledge is so valuable and reassuring. Thank you. So, um, so, so far we're answering the questions well, so that's good. Um, <laughs> I haven't got fired yet. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, nor have I, so this is great. Um, <laughs> but we're not through all the questions yet, so we'll see if we can keep it up. <laughs> um, but we'll go right into the next question. I just thought it'd be nice to share that with you, that um, the information you. you're Thank sharing you. is valuable. So, um, so we're, we're jumping, we just talked about zone one and now we're jumping down to zone three. So this is a zone three question. Um, is there any particular cover crop that combats Canadian thistle in particular? And this is for, a, yeah, a Saskatoon orchard in zone three. <laughs> so thistle, so if you grabbed uh, uh, when weed stock, uh, what thistles tell you is you have anaerobic soils. So how deep are they, you know, and, and how established are they? Those are all are, are, uh, different levels of, of where we're at. But 
you know, normally when, when, if you have a couple thistles, it's not a bad thing, but when you start complaining about it is when they start taking over. So with anaerobic soils, what you want to do is create air in that soil and, you know, identifying number one, how deep is that, that compaction layer. And so anaerobic conditions, compaction, same, basically same thing. So you want to identify how deep is that anaerobic layer. And what that, that thistle is doing is actually trying to fix the, the situation. So if you, if you have the patience and, and the tolerance to thistle, okay, uh, it, it will work itself through. But what we want to do is have tap roots that we're going to drill down. And, you know, radishes are great from the standpoint of identifying where your hard pans are. Because when the radish is going down, then all of a sudden they'll grow sideways. And then finally it'll jump back down again or that the, the radish, when it's pushing through the soil, it'll look fairly skinny. And all of a sudden it starts kind of rounding off. What that's showing is it, it's hitting a layer of compaction. So it, it's not able to push right through. All of a sudden it slows down. It's still pushing down, but it's, it's kind of widening out until it, it breaks through and then it'll, it'll skinny up again. So when we're, we're looking at, at, you know, digging up radishes or, you know, canola plants or any of these, these tap roots that are going down, you can see where they, they make a, a, a hard left or a hard right. So that's the area where you're, you're, you're most interested in, in getting at. So your radishes are, you know, uh, for once again, going for organic, I've worked with organic producers where we have, uh, you know, thistle issues. And within two years, we've got it. So you would have to hunt to find a thistle. So if it is just a patch, uh, what I recommend for that is going in the spring, mowing it down, getting rid of the residue, then going in and, and working it. So we're going to do some tillage. So surgical tillage, we're going to go and we're going to, you know, knock the thistle back. But now we're going to go in, we're going to seed a bunch of tap roots. So we're going to seed some radishes. We're going to seed uh, some chicory, some sweet clover. So our, our, uh, we have a legume, a brassica. Could put sunflowers if you want, but if we're going to be mowing it later, it's going to be counterproductive. Uh, uh, we can put in some annual ryegrass or Italian ryegrass, sorry. We could put some fall rye if you want to help suppress other weeds. But we can go through and, you know, have these tap roots. And, and the key is, is having the radish, number one, because it's an annual, but we also want to have the chicory and the sweet clover. So those are going to be your biennials. What we'll do is we'll go in and, and any time that you see the thistles get taller than this cover crop that you're growing, you're going to go in, either going to mow it or just clip it. And when you're mowing it, once again, you're just taking, you know, the top of the thistle off just above or just below the top of your cover crop. So you may do some, some clipping of the top of the cover crop. If the radishes, the radishes will bolt and, and start flowering after 40 days. So if you see them bolting, knock them down. Once again, cut them as high as you can, but as low as you can, if that makes sense, to make sure that you, you know, you reset them. And what that radish will do, I seeded some radishes. I had a PVC pipe, an eight inch pipe. I see, I filled it full of soil and I put two seeds on the top of this, this six foot tube. I watered them, kept them growing all uh, for, for two months, for 60 days. Then I got a garden hose and I washed all the soil out of that PVC tube. And I measured the roots and those roots of the radishes went down 65 inches in 60 days. Wow. So if you can get that tap root going, going down and, you know, keep pushing it down, when it dies, that tuber is going to shrink down. And now you have a macropore going down into the soil with the chicory and the, and the sweet clover, it's going to go down. If it's really nasty where it's rock hard, those, those biennials are going to come down and they're going to hit this hard pan and they're going to just sit on top of that hard pan. In the spring, when you get moisture, you're going to get some water infiltration coming down. That hard pan is then going to soften because we have two to one swelling clays in, in North America. And now we're going to get those biennials. Now they're going to curve and they're going to start growing down. So they, they're going to grow through that hard pan. So during that time, so in the spring, if you go in and you, you terminate that cover crop and whether you reseed a, a new one or you say, okay, that's, you know, I've set the thistles back. That's all I need. 
Well, at least you have those tap roots going through that hard pan. So now you have, once again, those macro pores to allow roots in the future to go through. You have water infiltration. We're getting air into those systems. So long-winded way of, of going through it, but it is, you, you need to have this train of thought of how we're going getting those roots down there. If you go with perennials, those perennials, those roots don't die. You need those roots to die, to, to desiccate, to shrink down, to create a macropore. So we're getting air down into the soil. So we talked a little bit about how cows do on cover crops. Um, how do sheep fare? Are they, do they, did you have anything to say about how sheep do on cover crops? Not bad. <laughs> I didn't even see that one coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, and, and, you know, for sheep, I don't try pulling wool over anybody's eyes. Uh, <laughs> I try and be straightforward. So um, I have a lot of sheep producers using cover crops. The key is, is using species or managing these species so it's not taller than their eyes. Okay. Sheep hate things that they can't see over. Okay. So using low growing species or managing them so they're, they stay low. So intensive grazing, making sure that you're, when you're, when you're rotating back, that it doesn't get too tall. Uh, so absolutely. Um, and, and some of the neat things they are, and once again, looking at, uh, you know, the, the research and, and the management that they do in New Zealand and in Australia, uh, by using paddocks high in in uh, plantain and chicory actually acts as a natural dewormer okay so that and you know we even saw that in the buys and i use a lot of plantain and chicory in in my mixes and when when the owner brought the bison home he said he had to deworm the bulls but the heifers that i had they were clean and so when we're looking at sheep you know the the using once again high sugar uh, decent protein, um, those type of species, fast regrowth. And then the other issue is with sheep because they're nibblers. We want to make sure the growing point of these species is nice and low so that you're not taking that the, the, the actual growing point off. Mm -hmm. That growing point is low so that it will recover. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's a quick question just regarding uh, compost. As we were talking about compost, um, are there any good local sources? Like where would you source some quality compost? Um, there's there's uh, there's a few few good ones. Uh, the bad ones weed themselves out in a hurry. <laughs> so so that's that's the good thing. Um, like I know I've I've been working with Mike Dorian out of uh, out of Calgary. Uh, awesome guy to work with. Um, great educator also uh that that's one of the the bigger ones that i, that I work with but you know there's uh, there's a lot of places like right here in holds i know we have uh recycling bins that um i haven't had time to figure out where they're going and what they're doing with the compost but there's uh there's opportunity uh to you know to start up start up a, a composting business um so yeah just kind of shop around to look on kijiji um there's some some neat things you can be doing with at home uh, composters uh, like these johnson sue john uh, 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 composting systems it, it's it's really neat from the standpoint of uh they don't have to be large they can be nice and small you just have your your smokestacks in there to keep the keep them cool and uh, the other, the next step of it is once you have good compost, one of the things that, uh, that, that Jay Fear is doing at Monacan Farms is he has an old bathtub, he fills it full of compost, throws his earthworms in there, and so you have to keep it moist. So he keeps the, 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 the tap or the, the, the drain on the bottom open, and so any excess moisture goes through the, the compost and it drips out of the drain in the bottom. And that's what he uses as his magic uh, worm juice, as he calls it. <laughs> um, it is, you know, it's better than most of the compost teas out there. And so you make sure you dilute it because it is, it's potent uh, biologically. <laughs> so dilute about 10 to one and uh, you can use that as seed dressing as soil amendments. It's good stuff. Nice. So there's some comments here just saying um, people have loved the discussion. Thank you so much for your time. Um, 
lots of comments here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm just scrolling through to make sure I don't miss any um, questions, but um, yeah, everybody has great things to say about your knowledge, so thank you. Um, here's a question. Thank you. So, okay, regarding local compost. Um, so uh, this is a question from Colin. I'm making biocomplete compost via Dr. Elaine's soil food web school. So biology ver verified via microscope. Uh, happy to, oh, this is not a question. This is just Colin um, talking about compost. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, so there's there's a good yeah. source of local compost. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Place your orders now. <laughs> yeah, I will, um, I think I can download the, the um transcript of the chat so i will download that and make sure that everybody gets it after the meeting too because there's been a lot of um good info flying around in the in the chat box while we've been talking so i think that's okay there's one question um oh i'm not sure if that's can't remember from your intro but do you recommend blends i would say that you do recommend blends <laughs> but <laughs> i'm not sure if i missed yeah, that it, question it, it, if, if someone is interested in, in designing blends, um, give me a call, drop me an email, go, uh, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, uh, what other, I, I'm, All of them. I try and make myself available. Yeah. Um, sometimes I get a little buried. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. So, but yeah, it's, it's something if you have, uh, you know, interest, uh, to go through and design a blend for you absolutely and you know the the biggest thing is you know developing you know understanding what your needs are your, your needs assessment is is the biggest thing and, and the goals uh, when we first started doing these uh, these blends you know people would say yeah they want to grow cover crops so I'd, I would put together the blend for them and they would come back and they say, well, it didn't work. And I, well, why didn't it work? Well, it didn't fix nitrogen. Well, you didn't tell me you needed it to fix nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So, so it's asking these questions is, is, you know, fairly key in, in making this work mm -hmm. so that if you're looking at, um, you know, putting something together and you're looking for, uh, um, you know, these chaos gardens or, you know, what plants are synergistic, which ones are antagonistic, absolutely um and then you know what densities and, and everything else yeah. um, have have a, a, a spreadsheet that i use so it's it's really easy to you know to conform these blends to to make things work for you nice yeah yeah so i will um i do have a copy of the slides that you used today so after our presentation today for those of you that are still on the call i'll send an email out to everyone and uh, i'll include the slides on that i'll also try and download this chat because there's a lot of good um, sources that were put up in the chat while you were presenting and while we were going through all the questions that were asked um, so i'll do that and then in about a week or so i'll have um, our recording of this chat up on our YouTube so people can always go back and and check it that way so there's three different things for people to go back and get the info um, but yeah thank you Kevin for your time that was great that was a great discussion there were so many questions um, I feel like you were tested and uh, <laughs> rose to the challenge for sure there was a lot of questions flying at you from all over the place so so well done this is this is the neat thing with regen egg like all the principles it doesn't matter where you are in the world or what you're doing the principles are the same it's the trying to figure out the application of them yeah so it's it's you know, integrating systems and when we can start integrating these systems and you know working on you know the limitations of what we have and the, and the issues that we've identified yeah it, the the whole system you know we're looking for functionality at, at the end of the day and whether it's orchards if it's uh, uh, forestry if it's uh, fruits and vegetables native pastures uh, cropland converting uh, from uh, high input um, improving an organic system all of these things it, it's it's so interesting but it goes back to functional carbon in our soil mm -hmm. so it, it's it's interesting it's just trying to take a step back looking at the big picture and how do we make the system better yeah. so I commend everybody for uh, for attending and the questions like the questions are awesome um thanks for everybody's attention it was uh, it was a good good uh, two hours spent 
Yeah, definitely. That was great. So yeah, thank you everyone for your time. Um, Kevin, thank you so much for answering all our questions about cover crops. And yeah, we will uh, hopefully see everyone somewhere along the way soon. <laughs> okay, take care everybody. And thank you again, Kevin. Bye-bye.